G'day and welcome to the AOS Coach sneak peek into the Season 1 of General's Handbook 2022. Games Workshop were kind enough to send me a copy of this book in advance, but they're not going to see this before it goes live. In this particular video, I'm going to focus on the Seasons Battle Pack, which is due to last for about 6 months. And in the Battle Pack, you will find Realm Rules, Core Battalions, Grand Strategies and Battle Tactics. You will also notice on the page that there is some lore, there's some uh, updated war scrolls for the Universal Endless Spells, Geminid, Shackles, etc, etc, as well as 12 other battle plans. Now, there is going to be a separate video for the other parts of the book not covered in this particular video. So let's go explore the splintered lands of Galet. This season in the match play rules, we focus on a continent of Galet in the Realm of Beasts. It's an unforgiving land that quickly separates the strong from the weak, and it favours those who can quickly adapt to the gruelling conditions. Galet, the splintered land, is a region characterised by scourging cyclones that sweep across its surface, carving unusual shapes out of the porous rock formations and howling through as many sinkholes and ravines. These conditions favour only the hardiest beings, and as a result, only the brutish creatures like the ogres, the oryx, and the gargans prosper here, or at least above ground. The return of Kragnos and the cosmic upheaval caused by Alariel's right of life has seen many of the armies converge upon Gur, often in search of deposits of amber stone that were unearthed in the tectonic throes of the realm, or perhaps to investigate the appearances of the elemental entities known as incarnates. Beneath the surface of Galette is a different world entirely, the continent is riddled with caverns and tunnels whose walls exhibit strained textures and formations, as though they were bored by gargantuan tunneling beasts. In this season, the wise general will put their stock into their veterans, because in Galette, battles are not won by glorious cavalry charges or the flashing shock assaults, but actually in the meat grinder of the front lines, where grit, experience, skill, and the fighters bond with their comrades are most valuable assets. When you play in this battle pack, you will forfeit the special rules and abilities that you had in other battle packs, such as the Gurish Heartlands from the General's Handbook 2021. So what that means to you is that there's no Hunters of the Heartland, no Metamorphosis, no Predators and Prey, and no Seismetic Shift unless it's stated in this book. Let's start with the Realm Magic that's available, and every wizard will have access to one particular spell, in addition to any other spell that they know, and this spell is called the Gaze of Gur. Gaze of Gur is a spell that has a casting value of 7 and a range of 12. If successfully cast, you get to pick one enemy unit that's within range and visible to the caster. When determining the number of models that an enemy unit has that's contesting an objective, the unit that you've cast the spell on will actually half that number rounding down which is a great spell. It's not too hard to cast on a 7. It's not too easy either. It does have the potential of having a high impact when you're contesting an objective or attempting to complete a battle tactic. Now, because you don't have to pick this spell in advance, it is going to be flexible when you need it. You just need to remember that it's available to you. You'll gain access to a Realm Command ability that can be used in addition to any other Realm Commands that you would have, and that is Overwhelming Assault. Now you can use this command ability at the end of your charge phase. The unit that receives the command must be a Galetian veteran. We'll explain a bit more about that in a minute. But it has to be a Galetian veteran that has 10 or more models in the unit. When you activate the command, you will get to pick one enemy unit that's within one inch of the unit that has a wounds characteristic of four or less, and you roll a dice. If the roll is greater than the number of models in that enemy unit, the strike last effect applies to that enemy unit for the following combat phase. So unless I'm missing something here, this more feels more like underwhelming assault. I love that this command ability can be used in the charge phase and it's not competing with my other combat phase commands. So it's not going to compete with all out attack or all out defense or anything that's faction specific. But it does mean that if I have to re-roll my charge using forward to victory, it does mean that I wouldn't be able to use overwhelming assault because it would conflict in both the charge phase. Now, it could be helpful if I charge into a small unit that has four wounds or less characteristics. So a minimum size unit of, say, Bulgors or uh, Crypt Flayers, Spirit Host, uh, Rock Gut Trogoths, Annihilators, you get the point. Now, the reason I mentioned that it has to be a minimum size 
is because if I charge into, let's say, that unit of three Crypt Flayers, there are three models in there. I'm going to have to roll a four plus to make them strike last. If they are reinforced units, so that's going from three to six, I'm not going to be able to beat that roll. It's not even equal. It's just I have to roll greater. Unless there's a way to boost it, which I have not found, um, it might be beneficial to you if you're charging a small unit. Now, is this a good use of a command point? Well, if I'm at the bottom of the turn and I've got plenty of command points that I'm willing to burn, it could be worth the chance of, of rolling the four up if you charge into the unit of three. It's very situational. And, it, and if I do roll that four up, for example, in this situation of a unit of three, um, if I charge a unit of five, obviously I'm going for a six then. But, you know, on average, you're looking for things with, you know, models of three. It might help me uh, shuffle my order of activations in combat because now I know this unit's going to strike last. So I can attack with somewhere else and, you know, my order of activation will change and I don't have to worry about how much damage that's being hit back to me. But it does feel niche to me, but let's see if the meta shifts and the army compositions do boil down into more of these three-bodied units as opposed to maybe reinforced or double reinforced. There are three special rules you need to know about when playing in Galat. The first one being Mastered of the Splintered Lands, and it's going to put context into this Galatian Veterans keyword that you've started to see creep in already on this video, because I do want you to take note, it becomes important with your battle plans and some of the other interactions. The core battalions do play around with Galatian Veterans as well. Anyway, what is a Galatian Veteran? Friendly battle line units, so they have to be battle line, that have a wounds characteristic of four or less, and that don't have a mount trait. If they meet those three criteria, their battle line, under, four wounds or under, and not mounted, they're going to gain the Galetian Veteran keyword. Pretty straightforward. If you want to gain more Galetian Veterans, you're going to want to be picking up more battle line. If you want to be avoiding some of those Galetian Veterans, you're going to want to be screening, especially with non-battle line troops. It'll make more sense as we go through this. The second rule you want to know about is the Proving Grounds. This one has the potential of being high impact. At the start of the battle round, after the players are determined who goes first, the player who goes second can pick one of the objectives on the battlefield to be the Proving Ground, and that lasts until the end of the battle round. Now, the same objective cannot be picked as a Proving Ground more than once per battle, and only one objective at any time can be marked as a proving ground. So once you've done it in turn one, you did the, I don't know, top right field one, no longer can that be chosen as a proving ground as the game progresses. Now, when you pick the objective to be a proving ground, only models that have the Galetian Veterans keyword can test the objective on the proving ground. So we talked earlier, they're the battle line with four wounds or under that are not mounted. Only that particular unit with those keywords will be able to contest that particular objective in that particular battle round. Obviously, when we move into the next battle round, there'll be a different proving ground, but you kind of get the, the, the gist of this. If you win the priority role and you get to choose who goes first or goes second, this may be a deciding factor on if you take second because you'll likely want to deny your opponent a chance to score if they have no veterans around the objective or it may force them to uh, move their castle to go score it or they might have to give it up completely or maybe it gives yourself a chance to get a lead because your veterans are there to contest and theirs aren't finally you have the bonds of battle now when a model is in a galetian veteran we know that is a battle line four wounds or less not mounted and it makes a melee attack you can target an enemy unit within half an inch of another model from the Galetian Veteran unit instead of using the weapon's range characteristic for that attack. If you do so, the attacking model must be within half an inch of another model for it to use its range within half an inch. Whew! Took me a couple of goes to get my head across it, and if you play 40k, this may be familiar to you. Let's break it down. Basically, what it means is that those battle line units that have a large base. So we talked about Bulgor, for example. Crypt Flayers is another one. There's a lot of example of these battle line four uh, wound or less not mounted. One of their biggest challenges being on like a 50 mil base is that it's hard to get, when you reinforce the unit into six or nine, it's really hard because their range is not large enough to get them all into combat. 
and you often find there's a lot of wasted attacks. What this is going to allow you to do is really maximize the potential of fighting in two ranks. Now, if you're on a 25 mil or even a 32 mil, you might find that this doesn't really benefit you that much because when you are um, on a 25 mil base, you can already fight in two ranks if you position them um, in a cloud shape. One of the big impacts of the Nomadi thralls when they got a two inch attack is it meant that you could get more of those attacks in if you're a deep kin player. And I know I've kind of made an oversimplification here and the positioning and the opponent unit size and all of that stuff's going to come into play. A reinforced unit of 10 Blight Kings would be a good example that would benefit from these attacks. You rarely see them as reinforced units going from 5 to 10 because coherency will often stop them getting all of their attacks in. And because of their large base and their small weapon range, you often find there's a lot of wasted attacks. Now, if I get them within half an inch, so Blight King rank two is within half an inch of rank Blight King one, and they're within range of half an inch of the enemy, it means I'm fighting with two ranks of attacks as opposed to just the ones that are basically base to base. I hope that makes sense. Once you kind of play it out with your models, it makes more sense. But basically, this is what it means. It means you can fight in two ranks as long as you're within half an inch of each other. There are two new core battalions that you can use, as well as the ones that are found in the core rules, a Battle Regiment, Warlord as examples. Now, much like Hunter of the Heartland in the last General's Handbook, you cannot include multiple versions of this battalion, but you can choose both of the options if you'd like. Expert Conquerors requires you to have two units of troops, and then a third optional one if you would like to add a third to it. And this only benefits those Galetian veterans. If you are going to be running things like in troops with five wounds or more characteristic, it's not going to benefit those Puskor Blight Lords. It's not going to benefit your Blood Knights. It's just for those Galetian veterans. Each Galetian veteran model in this battalion will count as three models when you are contesting objectives. And this is gonna be a great little battalion if you are trying to build a bit more of a defensive type army, you wanna get on the objective, maybe you've got a small unit of troops and it's very hard for your unit of three or six, whatever it might be, to hold objectives against larger bodies. Or maybe it's gonna make things like you run a whole bunch of zombies and a whole bunch of clan rats let's say 60 zombies, you've now terms that by three, that means if there were 60, you were all on the objective, they're now counting as 180. You probably don't need that much, but you get the example here. If you want to double down, you may want to look at your faction rules and see, are there any allegiance abilities that interact with the objective? The first one that came to mind to me was the Stormcast, when you've got the Hammers of Sigma sub legions, and what the Hammers allows you to do is you'll get a six up ward when your troops are wholly within 12 inches of the objective. So not only will I count as three, let's say my Vindictors, I've got a unit of, of five Vindictors, they're counting as 15 and getting a six up ward as well while being in range of the objective. That's pretty hard to shift. The other one is Bounty Hunters, and I think this is going to be probably the more popular one of the two. And it requires you as well to have two units of troops, and it gives you the option of having a third unit of troops if you'd like. The difference here, though, between Expert Conquerors and um, uh, Bounty Hunters is that this one doesn't require you to be Galetian veterans. So I can bring in my Pascoils, I can bring in my Forminators, I can bring in my Storm Drake Guard or whatever it might be, right? Anything that is defined as a troop will be able to go into this particular battalion. Now, basically, this makes this unit a Galetian veteran hunter. And what it does is if your unit, let's say Forminators, you've got a unit of Forminators in this bounty hunter battalion, and they go fight a Galetian veteran unit, they're going to get to add plus one to their damage characteristic for melee weapon attacks. So that's pretty awesome. It's not going to benefit you if you are going to be fighting monsters or non galetian veteran units, but they become true veteran hunters. So your Blood Knights, your Forminators, your Puskal Blight Lords, your Varangard, as long as they're not in the Empty Throne, uh, Mournfang Pack, for example, um, even things like Witch Elves. I talked about these mounted type models, but even my Witch Elves who are a Galetian veteran, I could put them into this battalion and each of those uh, blade attacks, if they go through, will count as two points of damage instead of one. So 
could be a great way to get through Thunder Lizard if you've got a, a Seraphon player kind of causing you headaches. Or it could just be a, a great way to do a whole bunch of damage. There are six new grand strategies to choose from, and you will quickly notice that they are harder than what we used to in the last General's Handbook. Things like Hold the Line, Prize Sorcery, and Beastmaster are not here. No place for the weak is scored when there are no battle line units from your opponent's starting army on the battlefield. Tame the Land is scored when you control all of the objectives on the battlefield that are wholly outside your territory. Defend what's ours is completed when there are no enemy units wholly within your territory. Take what's theirs is completed when there are more friendly units than enemy units wholly within your opponent's territory. Demonstration of strength is completed when there are three or more Galetian veteran units from your starting army on the battlefield. And finally, show of dominance is completed if there are friendly Galetian veteran units in each quarter of the battlefield. Defend what is ours, no place for the weak, and demonstration of strength are probably my preferred grand strategies from this list if I'm not picking from my faction. Now, by the way, if you have faction grand strategies, you're not forced to do these uh, grand strategies. You can still pick the ones from your book or the White Dwarf. Uh, demonstration of strength would work nicely for my Gloom Spike Gits, who are traditionally a horde army with lots of single wound troops on the board. And it can be really tough to grind down those 140, 160 grots, especially when I'm retreating and rallying and maybe using Emerald Life Swarm or whatever it might be. It could be very hard to pull down them. Defend what ours would complement any of my castle armies where I've got potentially a center, a juicy center that has some strong magic and strong shooting. And I've got screens all over that's going to push my opponent away from my territory. And anyone that comes into my territory, long strikes, bow snakes, anything that I've got that can do serious damage would uh, take off those models that approach my territory. No place for the weak will really depend on how armies start to shift their focus towards strengthening their battle line and the rise of Night Haunt, even the, the switch from Soul Blight to go to more zombies or maybe even skeletons or direwolves as opposed to what we saw in the past, which was like Graveguard and, and Blood Knights. If, if they go really heavy towards bodies, this might be really tough for me to do. So if I choose it, I really need to focus and make sure I've got the tools to remove those those models and uh, hopefully you know stop them from retreating and denying me to score those grand strategies. So if your army does have, like I mentioned, the grand strategies from White Dwarf or an updated battle tome, or maybe your book is coming up soon, you aren't going to be forced to take these. Um, although my Gloom Spike gets who have neither of those, uh, I will have to pick these six. But my Daughters of Cain, I've got a plethora of different options I can choose from. There are eight battle tactics for you to choose from in addition to the ones that are in your faction. Gaining momentum, you pick one enemy unit on the battlefield and you complete it if that unit is destroyed during the turn and you control more objectives than your opponent in this turn. An eye for an eye is scored when one or more of your friendly units were destroyed in the previous turn and if one or more units are destroyed this turn. So it's a little of revenge battle tactic. I love that one. Desecrate their land, you pick one terrain feature or faction piece of terrain that is partially or wholly within enemy territory, and you'll score it if you control that terrain feature in that turn. Now, controlling a terrain feature is no different to controlling an objective, uh, and it's in the core cool rules if you want to see what the rule is and how it's done. This one's mine. You get to pick one enemy unit on the battlefield and you're going to score it if that unit is destroyed in that turn by attacks made by your general. Head to head, you get to pick one enemy Galatian veteran unit on the battlefield and you complete the battle tactic if that unit is destroyed during the turn by an attack made by a friendly Galatian unit or an ability by a fr friendly Galatian unit. So it's basically Galatian on Galatian. Out muscle, you get to pick one enemy Galatian veteran unit um, that has models contesting an objective under the proving grounds. You complete the battle tactic if no models from that enemy unit are contesting the proving ground at the end of that turn. Whether you kill them, you make them retreat or redeploy, whatever it might be. Against the odds, you get to pick one unit from the starting army on the battlefield. And you complete it if at the end of the turn, any models from that unit are contesting an objective that you control. And the objective is not being contested by an enemy Galetian veteran model. Finally, barge through enemy lines is completed if there are two or more units from your starting army that are wholly within your opponent's territory at the end of the turn. 
Now, if two or more of those were Galetian veterans, you're going to score an extra victory point for that. Now, as you can see here, the incentive structure is heavily leaning towards Galetian veterans, and there is no turn one auto completes. A perfect example was Ferocious Advance. Everyone would run three models, and if they were monsters, they would get an extra victory point. Those simple, super simple ones are no longer there. So it's definitely forcing you to get into the thick of the battle and get onto objectives probably earlier than what we had in the past. The final thing to call out here is that there are 12 battle plans with a variety of different deployment maps, a uh, different number of objectives that are going to be on the table with some as large as eight objectives. And there are a few very interesting win conditions. And I'll be doing a deeper dive very shortly with uh, Jack from Rerolling Ones. So depending on when you watch this video, it's either going to be live or within 48 hours of this video going up. Now, a couple of the unique battle plans that I'll call out is first off the Realmstone Cache, where um, the objective is going to explode and scatter in turn three. The Nidius Path allows you to teleport from the table edge if your unit is within six inches of the corner, so you go from corner to corner. And there's another one called Battle Lines Drawn, where you're fighting over four quadrants of the table, not any objectives. So there's a whole bunch of ones. They're not all as crazy as I just mentioned, but some of them will have also incentives to use or score with Galetian veterans. So there's a lot to unpack here, and it's going to mean different things for different armies. Armies like Beasts of Chaos, Nurgle, Ogre Gutbusters, who have access to a lot of large base troops, they're going to love the Bonds of Battle and to see how they can tap into that extended range, and they may reconsider reinforcing those troops. The two new core battalions may have players questioning if Battle Regiment is still worth taking, or if the extra damage from Bounty Hunters or the greater objective control from Expert Conquerors is going to be a better choice than going one drop. And those people who relied on Hunters of the Heartland in the past are going to need to reconsider what happens if your troops get roared at, because in the past, you've been able to have that automatic command point being issued because you've had the Hunters of the Heartland protection. Now that's gone, that may be more impactful on where you apply your roars. The Gaze of Gur is going to be a great little spell to add to the rotation for your wizards, or maybe you want to ally a wizard in so they can cast the Gaze of Gur. Uh, this is going to be great for you if you're not taking Expert Conqueror's Battalion, uh, and as we know, that makes your units count as three on the objective if they're in the battalion. Sorry, Corn, you don't get this spell. You're just going to have to kill them. I don't really expect the use of the Realm Command ability anytime soon, except in very niche situations while I think the Proving Grounds Realm Rule is going to make a very interesting side game. I haven't had a chance to play this book. This book has only landed in my, in my lap a few days ago, so I can't tell you exactly how impactful that's going to be, but it is going to make you start thinking about who goes first and who goes second if you win the priority role. This will be potentially impactful on battle plans that have less objectives i mentioned in the past there is going to be some some battle plans that have eight, up to eight objectives on the table proving grounds may not be as impactful there but if you're playing on something that only has three or four or two objectives then the proving grounds could be quite interesting on how it's played out you may want to think about how many veterans you have and how mobile your veterans are going to be uh how you deploy them how many you have them so that if you lose a um a proving ground and your opponent gets to choose you've got the ability to respond and challenge for it um, because if you don't have enough of those galetian veterans you may find yourself denied from scoring vp i think from the battalion side though that extra point of damage could concern a lot of armies and you may want to consider if you haven't already included it cheap screens to help you protect your veterans and absorb the damage you may want to start looking at things that could debuff your opponent whether it's their to hit, to wound, uh, reduce their rend, improve your save. You know, the extra damage is not going to make that much of a difference if you can make their attacks fail. So look at ways, you know, Frostheart Phoenix Cities of Sigma, perfect example, a minus one to wound bubble. I know there are plenty of spells that can reduce, you know, my Gloom Spike gets netters, they minus one to hit. Any way I can kind of reduce and um, minimize the amount of attack coming in. Maybe we've got an endless spell that can make charges harder or reduce the amount of models that get into combat. Maybe I've got something like Nighthaunt where I can get a, a boosted or improved uh, ward save. Whatever it might be, 
I can see this battalion being quite popular in the early book. It may drop off as the, the months go along and, and maybe it's a bit of an overkill, but it's definitely a tool that you want to consider and how you minimize the impact for that. One of the ways I'm thinking about reducing the impact is getting a monster hero that can go in and go hunt those uh, bounty hunters because when let's say Marathi or Vampire Lord or Zombie Dragon or some type of really combaty monster hero goes into that bounty hunter unit, they're not going to get the plus one damage because my Marathi, Vampire Lord, Terror guys, whatever it might be, they're not Galetian veterans. So I, I get to reduce the impact of that minor, that plus one damage because they're not getting it on me and my Galetian veterans are going around attacking somewhere else. But hey, let me know in the comment section how you are seeing these rules impact your army and your list. Are there units now that you're reconsidering to include because of Galetian veteran or some of the realm rule abilities? Is there some things that you used to run in the last General's Handbook that are no longer as sexy as they used to be and maybe they're going to go on a little holiday for the next six months? By the way, it is only going to be here for six months. This is Season 1, so we'll have it up till somewhere around December, January. And then I imagine Season 2 will kick in sometime afterwards and take us through until, uh, let's say, June 2023. But uh, I'm excited to play this either way. I'm curious to see how this all kind of plays out. Thanks for sticking around until the end. I hope you found that video interesting and you walked away with a few new ideas. If you did, I would appreciate it if you hit like on the video as well as left me a comment. Let me know what your thoughts are in the comment section below. The conversation will continue over on Discord, so links down below in the episode description if you want to join the Discord and continue the Age of Sigmar conversation. I want to give a massive shout out as well to these absolute bloody legends, these champions who have continued to support me through Patreon or YouTube members. That is going directly into supporting the maintenance and the growth of this channel. So thank you very much, guys. Much appreciated. And until next time, roll more sixes.